I think one of the most important points in this presentation is to address um, additive versus absolute when it comes to invasive versus non-invasive ventilation. And this is extremely important and often gets overlooked and can be deleterious to your patient outcomes. So ventilators are additive as far as pressure support and PEEP. And what it means is that pressure support is in addition to the PEEP. However, on standalone machines, they're absolute. That IPAP and EPAP are separate entities and are not in addition to one another. So how does that translate into real world application? So if you have a standalone machine, such as BiPAP Vision by Respironix, and it's set to IPAP 10 and EPAP of five, when the patient initiates inspiration, the machine will deliver 10 centimeters of water when the patient inhales, and when the patient exhales, the machine will deliver five centimeters of water pressure. And peak inspiratory pressures during inspiration would be 10 centimeters of water. However, on LTV 1200 and other ventilators capable of providing invasive modes, this is totally different. And when pressure support is set at 10 and PEEP is set at 5, when the patient initiates inspiration, the ventilator will deliver 15 centimeters of water pressure because pressure support is in addition to PEEP. So 10 plus 5 equals 15. So inspiratory pressure would be 15. When the patient exhales, it will be 5 centimeters of water pressure and peak inspiratory pressures upon inspiration would be 15 centimeters of water pressure. PIP and PP, these are abbreviations and they stand for peak inspiratory pressures and the meaning is point of maximal proximal airway pressure. And what it means is that the pressure in the circuit to the proximal airway during the peak moment of uh, inhalation. Here's a video of me demonstrating what uh, pressure support in addition to PEEP looks like on the LTV1200 interface. Now I want to show you what it looks like on the ventilator. So if you, if you, if you pay attention to the screen. So we set this ventilator on non-invasive uh, ventilation. We have uh, pressure support of 10 and we have PEEP of 5, right? So when the patient takes a breath, right, they're getting 10 of pressure support ventilation and during escalation, they're getting a five. And what I want you to pay attention here, right? Look at the peak inspiratory pressure, right? You see it says 17 now, right? But what did we say we put our uh, pressure support? We put it at 10, right? And I said they're additive because when you take pressure support and you take peak, they're combined, so they should be 15. So now, even though I'm squeezing it, you know, you'll see 17, 18, but they're combined. And if, it even says so on, on the top button, pressure support plus PEEP, right? You see the additive, right? So if, if you came in and you wanted to actually set the patient on a standalone and the, and, the, and the standalone was 10 over 5, you would have to set this 5 over 5 to give you 10 over 5. So I'll show you. So now we set, so now the pressure will drop. So now you see when the patient inhales, it's 10, and when they exhale, it's 5. Because, again, they're additive. So if, if you come in and you see 10 over 5 and you proceed to set them at 10 over 5, you will actually set them at 15 or even higher uh, than that uh, on the ventilator. And this is the main reason why this is so crucial to understand. With peak inspiratory pressures in excess of 30 centimeters of water pressure, with non-invasive ventilation can cause severe gastric insufflation by entraining air into the gastric tract. Thus, you need to remember that non-invasive ventilation mask sits over the mouth and the nose and it instills air into both the trachea and the esophagus. It's unlike an endotracheal tube that isolates the trachea and only forces air into the lungs. Hence why with non-invasive ventilation, gastric insufflation can lead to patient vomiting. And because of the tight uh, fitted mask, the risk of aspiration is extremely high, and due to this concern of gastric insufflation and patient vomiting, gastric decompression via nasogastric tube or gastric tube may be performed prior to non-invasive uh, ventilation application, because as you understand, a face mask facilitates air uh, insufflation into both the trachea and the, and the esophagus. You would want to avoid pressures that exceed 30 centimeters of water pressure on your manometer, and the reason being is because upper esophageal sphincter can be overcome with pressures in excess of 30 centimeters of water pressure. And this was done in a study 
uh, that measured monometric monometrically uh, the sphincter tone. And you could find the study at the bottom of the screen. It was published in the Journal of Gastroenterology in 1972. And they found that if you keep the pressures under 30 centimeters of water pressure, they should not cause gastric insufflation. Uh, on the other hand, the lower esophageal sphincter, also known as cardiac sphincter, uh, requires only 20 centimeters of water pressure to overcome it. So as you see, the lower you go, the less pressure is required to begin instilling air into the gastric tract. This study was conducted on healthy individuals with healthy sphincter tone. And in sick patients, the sphincter tone may not be as good. And in addition, they may be on medication that further loosens their sphincter tone. In such instances, pressures in excess of 20 centimeters of water pressure may be sufficient to overcome the sphincters and begin instilling air into the gastric tract. And patient may subsequently vomit and aspirate. So you always need to be mindful uh, with sick patients who are on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Here I have a BiPAP vision machine by Respironix. And I want to go over the user interface that you will see on this machine. So whenever you arrive at the facility, this is the interface that will appear on the machine. And you see at the top left-hand corner, IPAP is set at 15, EPAP is set at 6. And at the bottom of the picture, we have peak inspiratory pressure at 15 centimeters of water pressure. So peak inspiratory pressure, as was stated earlier, is the pressure in the circuit to the proximal airway at the end of inspiration. And it's absolute, meaning uh, these two terms, IPAP and EPAP, they are not additive. LTV1200, on the other hand, has pressure support in addition to PEEP, and it's clearly demonstrated in the user manual. So here we have two graphics to delineate uh, these aspects. On the left-hand corner, we have pressure support set at 20, peak inspiratory pressure set at 20, PEEP is going to be zero, and span will be zero. On the right-hand corner, we have pressure support set at 20, and PEEP set at five. So when they combine, they're going to give us peak inspiratory pressures at 25, and spend is once again 20. So if you forgot that uh, on LTV1200, the additive, you could just look at the user interface, and above the pressure support dial, uh, you clearly see pressure support plus PEEP. And uh, this gives you an idea that whenever you input pressure support, uh, it will be in addition to PEEP. Here I have respiratory abbreviation pertinent to our discussion. And I want to focus our attention on PIP, which is peak inspiratory pressure. And the definition is point of maximal airway pressure. And the second abbreviation is delta P. And it's the triangle P. And it refers to the difference between peak inspiratory pressure minus positive and expiratory pressure. Delta P assessment parameter will become an important tool in certain brands of uh, non-invasive ventilation. Here, I want to talk about obtaining all three sets of parameters whenever you arrive at any facility. So as soon as you make patient contact and you see what type of device they're on, either a ventilator or a standalone non-invasive machine, you always want to get into a habit of obtaining all three parameters. And three parameters being peak inspiratory pressure, pressure support ventilation, and positive and expiratory pressure if they're on invasive ventilator capable of providing non-invasive mode and IPAP and EPAP setting if they're on standalone machine. So have your ACR or PCR and write down all three settings. Another way of saying the exact same thing is if you have uh, a machine that's only showing you peak inspiratory pressure and positive and expiratory pressure without showing you pressure support setting, you could quickly obtain pressure support setting by performing a very easy uh, subtraction. So if you see a machine that's giving you peak inspiratory pressure of 15 centimeters of water and positive and expiratory pressure of 5 centimeters of water, you could perform a delta P assessment. And delta P is basically change in pressure. So here, the change in pressure is 10. And the way I obtain this value is by doing 15 minus 5. And 10 in this case will be our pressure support setting. Here's a video demonstration of me performing a test lung test or a sum term it test glove test. This is going to be basic uh, test lung test or uh, well tests of some term. So you come in and you basically, uh, you came and the respiratory therapist told you, all right, we have a patient, he's on standalone, uh, non-invasive uh, ventilation, uh, peak inspiratory pressures of 10, uh, 
is pressure support of 10 and uh, PEEP of 5. So on a standalone, we said they're absolute, they're one additive, but on our machine, they're additive. So now you have to set 10 over 5. So, you know, so you come in, you turn on your machine, right? And you're going to select new patient. Select, right? Hopefully we're dealing with an adult, right? And the machine starts cycling off. So you want to you want to start them off with non-invasive positive pressure, and the way you get to this mode, you select it, and it's going to start blinking, like this. You hit it one more time, and it's going to set, set say set EPAP, right? So let's say you didn't know, and you put ten, like the the respiratory uh, therapist told you, you put ten, and then you put people five, right? So now so now we're setting at ten over five, but remember, like I said, you got to check your peak inspiratory pressure. So you grip your uh, you test your lung. And you quickly look at your peak inspiratory pressure right here. So you see it's it's not it's not giving me ten peak inspiratory pressures of ten. It's giving you peak inspiratory pressures of much higher. So you see it's it's giving me peak inspiratory pressures of ten plus five, seventeen in this case. Right? So we didn't set it correctly because the respiratory said peak inspiratory pressures were ten, pressure support was ten on standalone or IPAP was 10 on standalone, and uh, EPAP was 5 on standalone. So the way you adjust this, you'll come to your ventilator, change this to 5, right? Now you have 5 over 5, and you check your peak inspiratory pressures with your glove, right? You see how it, it dropped to 11. So now we have peak inspiratory pressures of 10, 11. We're delivering 10 of pressure support when the patient takes a breath, and we have 5 of PEEP when the patient exhales. So now our settings are correct. and the glove facilitates this acquisition. Another thing is, what's important, um, when you turn this ventilator on, so I wanna show you this very simple. When you turn this ventilator on, and you start selecting new patient, right? And we wanna set NPPV. And you, you see how I cycle through NPPV, and when I hit it, because I have a circuit attached, it quickly set, set IPAP, right? So I know exactly what I'm doing. Now, if you didn't have the glove attached and you had a circuit leak, so I wanna show you if we did not have this connected. So, no long, just this, right? I turn this on. I, se I select new patient. I select adult, right? And I wanna select and I wanna put in my uh, NPPV. And when I cycle to NPPV, you see, even though I'm doing everything correctly, without the glove, it's telling me low pressure alarm, low pressure alarm, because the alarms uh, and limits will be a primary things. So you'll be standing there with the circuit, and you'll be doing everything correctly, but everything is blinking, and you don't know that it's at set IPAP and uh, uh, set your EPAP, because you don't have the connection, right? So. The, the test line accommodates that for you and it allows you to basically set it correctly and check your all three parameters. So whenever whenever you're in the facility, always do this because A, it will give you all three numbers and two, you're not going to be uh, worrying about what to set, what's blinking, what's not blinking because it's, it's clearly displayed on the screen. So again, we're going to do a new patient, right? We're going to do adult, right? We're going to cycle through NPPV, hit it again. Set IPAP, right? Set PEEP or EPAP, and we're good to go. We're in non invasive positive pressure, and we're delivering, uh, at this case, PEEP of 17, right? Pressure support of, of uh, 10 plus 5, 15, and PEEP of 5. How do we choose the proper mode of non invasive ventilation? And essentially, the way we set Non-invasive ventilation is based on patient needs and patient presentation. Do they have an oxygenation problem or do they have a ventilation problem? And if the patient is presenting with hypoxemic respiratory failure in critical care medicine, this is known as type 1 respiratory failure or failure of oxygen exchange. These patients have oxygenation issues and your subset of patients will be CHF patients with acute pulmonary edema. That's your classic example. The other example would be respiratory failure in patients with pneumocystitis pneumonia. And another example would be respiratory failure in immunocompromised patients, especially in hematologic malignancies and transplant patients. 
So what these patients need is they need CPAP and they need PEEP. The other is hypercapnic respiratory failure. And this is known as type 2 respiratory failure in critical care medicine. And uh, these patients have a failure of carbon dioxide exchange. They have a failure to ventilate. And the classic example would be acute exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And the other examples would be acute exacerbation of asthma and respiratory failure in patients with cystic fibrosis. And what these patients need is they need pressure support ventilation or they need IPAP, inspiratory positive airway pressure, to get the adequate minute ventilation going. Very simply, for a type 1 problem, what the patient needs is CPAP, PEEP, or EPAP. They need that pressure to stand the alveoli open and get that real estate so the patient can exchange oxygen uh, through their alveoli, through diffusion. So if you give this patient just a non-rebreather mask with 100% oxygen, uh, that mask is not going to do him anything because 100% uh, oxygen via non-rebreather mask does not offer continuous positive airway pressure. So the modality these patients require is CPAP, PEEP, and EPAP. And you would initially start at 5 centimeters of water pressure and titrate it based on patient presentation and response. And for type 2 problems, uh, what the patient needs are pressure support ventilation on an uh, invasive ventilator that's capable of providing non-invasive ventilation, or IPAP on standalone machine. So pressure support and IPAP during inspiration, and PEEP, CPAP, and EPAP during expiration. Uh, these patients have hypercapnic failure of carbon dioxide exchange. Hypercapnia or hypercarbia both entail high CO2 uh, retention, and the only way to assist them is to provide them pressure support and IPAP. And your classic subset of population will be chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. These patients have alveoli that has lost their elasticity. So they don't have that snap back on their alveoli. So what they have is they're retaining all that carbon dioxide and they have intrinsic PEEP or auto PEEP, which is buildup of air inside their uh, thorax and inside their lungs. So what these patients need is they need pressure support and IPAP to start exchanging that air. So the initial um, setup would be 8 to 10 centimeters of water pressure and zero or seep and expiratory pressure for their PEEP and CPAP setting. Because honestly, these patients do not have an issue with oxygenation. These patients have ventilatory problem. So uh, at times you will see uh, clinicians placed everybody on 10 or 5. But ideally, you should set the settings based on what the patient needs and not just arbitrarily based on some uh, number. So to sum up non-invasive ventilation, not every patient needs 10 over 5. Very limited patients will get placed on both uh, ventilation and oxygenation support. Usually these are palliative care patients who have DNR and uh, most forms that specifically entail do not resuscitate, do not intubate. So those patients may be transported at 10 over 5. However, your acute pulmonary edema patient uh, simply need PEEP, CPAP, and EPAP to stand their alveoli open. And your asthmatics and COPDers need pressure support ventilation and inspiratory positive airway pressure ventilation in order to facilitate minute ventilation.